Hello everybody, so the German government has fallen. The main two villains you see in the screen currently, on the right hand side you have Schultz, he's the, he's the Chancellor of Germany, basically the, 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 the big boss. Next to him you have uh, Habeck, he is the leader of the Greens. These two people really still believe in this, you know, this, this, this green transition stuff. And I don't believe that Habeck is actually asking the question, did we screw Germany? I believe that he still thinks that he is doing the right thing. Schultz the same, and that's why somebody else had to be fired. And in this case, it was Christian Lindner who was the finance minister of the German government. And Lindner was basically, he was the, the, the head guy of the, of the third party that was uh, together with the SPD and the Greens. It, 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 it's the FDP. So um, Lindner, he proposed tax cuts. He proposed cutting climate subsidies, which obviously doesn't fall right with, with the Greens. And he was also proposing cutting public spending, which will then not fall right with the SPD. So over here, DW.com, that's an interesting website where you can find, you know, what is going on in Germany at this moment. They're, they're basically keeping a, 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 a blog post going. Uh, the most interesting bit is highlighted over here. Uh, they want to... They want to act, they want to speed up, uh, bring forward uh, the next election. So the original date for the election would have been November 2025, and now they are trying to bring it forward to March, um, in order to make sure that Germany has a functioning government. So when we look at you know how Germany ended up here, uh, this is this is a story that you know I, I've told. A lot of times already, but I, I keep I keep repeating this because repeating this makes the message stick better, especially to to review uh, to return viewers. So over reliance on Russian energy, uh, this is basically the main the initial driver that drove a nail into this coffin. Heavy dependence on Russian gas left. Germany vulnerable and energy price spikes hit industries hard when supplies became unstable. Why did supplies become unstable? Let's go to the first map over here. This is an, an oldish map. It's from 2021, but it, it, it shows whatever we need it to show at this moment because this was the situation before the war in Ukraine. And the irony here is that Ukraine is basically, it's highlighted in pink, you know, because these, because even though these pipelines are running through Ukraine, it basically, the country was being sidelined all, all the time. I also believe that the planning for this Ukraine war was ongoing for a long, long, long time before that we actually saw the war occur in, 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 in Ukraine. And that was the reason why uh, Schultz and Putin worked together to get Nord Stream 1 and 2 realized. So it goes from Vyborg and here Ustluga, and it then goes all the way up to Greifswald or Lubmin, where there's also an old nuclear power station that never actually went critical. Um, yeah, so those those pipelines have been destroyed. The, the Russian war broke out, or the, the Russian war of choice broke out in, you know, early 2022. So what happened was, uh, at some point, they, they, they knew that the, the, the gas transports through Ukraine were at risk. So they built Nord Stream 1 and 2. And in the end, Ukraine said, you know, to hell with that. We're going to blow up Nord Stream 1 and 2. So this whole, this whole Ukraine war uh, precipitated a huge gas crisis in Europe. Now, this, this wasn't the only reason why there was a, a gas crisis. I have to make sure that you understand this because there's also increased demand for gas from all over the, from all over the planet. And that's also the reason why you see a lot of LNG ports turning up. At this moment, Germany did not have any LNG ports. When, when this was happening, they were building a couple. Over here near, uh, near Hamburg, uh, Stad, I believe, it's one of those places where they have a LNG terminal, but they were relying on pipelines in order to get their gas. So this is one of the first hits that the German industry got when 
the war broke out. So over here we have a different map. This is a map that I'm still building. Uh, you can you can see what is going on over here. You can see the blue markers. Those used to be uh, nuclear plants. The red markers are either car manufacturing uh, facilities, coal plants. It, 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 it's pretty diverse, but we will return to this later on. So the nuclear phase out, closing nuclear power plants, increased the reliance on coal and gas, raising emissions and energy costs amidst... amidst EU carbon trading pressure, so that's the EU ETS. And don't don't mistake me, they really closed a lot of nuclear since 2005, so that's in less than 20 years. Uh, they closed nearly 20 nuclear power plants, nuclear power reactors. Uh, the slow renewable transition, you can say whatever you want. Uh, if you look at you know all the graphs, oh, they, they, they are shooting into the sky. That's what most people say. They are going so well. The prices are coming down so hard. And they're deploying so many windmills and so many solar panels. It just has to be a success, right? Well, if it were a success, then Volkswagen wasn't asking their employees to cut 10% of their wages. To be, you know, if they could cut 10% of their wages, which is something that they're asking Volkswagen employees right now. Imagine what is happening over at Opel at BMW, at Mercedes, at Ford, perhaps. Then we have the high industrial costs. Again, EU ETS, which is, you know, it's it's, it's, it's a bit the same as with the nuclear phase out. Um, what you get is, you get this, this, this carbon budget. If you exceed the budget, you have to pay a fine. The fine is now 100 euros per ton of CO2. That fine becomes increasingly more expensive so you know if you can't make cars if you can't make steel without the carbon emissions then you're out of luck because your wages are high your resource costs are high your energy costs are high and you have no fines for you know emitting carbon emissions that basically puts you out of business. And people say, okay, that's where why CBAM is there. CBAM is the, is, is the, 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 the border adjustment mechanism. So if you want to import steel from China, what they say at the border is, listen, this much carbon has been emitted to make this steel, so that's the, the extra that you the extra premium that you have to pay on top of this ton of steel that you're going to buy. So this should make EU steel competitive with other steel. But what happens is the cost for steel in Europe becomes prohibitively high. So what are we going to do? We're going to use less steel. We're going to basically turn down the economic knob and say, okay, we're going to do less because we can't afford any of this shit anymore. That, 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 that's basically the high, the, the, you know, the, the ramifications of EU ETS, CBAM, uh, together with the 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 worse competitive position that our that our industries have compared to uh, China and other countries, and the coalition tension. So what I just told you, we have three parties that are inherently different from each other, and they have competing visions on how to continue this this German economic, uh, or, or basically how to fix this German economic problem, and they all say, listen, we need to cure the patient using pill A, B, or C, and, and everybody says, well, you can't use pill A, and the other one says, you can't use pill B, and, and, and the other guy says, you can't use pill C, and because you can't, you can't reach any consensus over that, that's why your government fails. By the way, also interesting, the slow renewable transition, so what we're going to do is we're going to zoom in because this is something that I really need to highlight is that these renewables, you know, that's not a small industry. Over here, for instance, this is this is where they make these 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 large pylons uh, for for these for, for these for these windmills. Uh, what you see, this is a lot of this is a lot of steel that you need to fabricate over here. Uh, over here again uh, steel fabrication of one, one one kind or another. Then over here, you have, uh, again, Siemens Gamasa. They, they're building another factory 
where they were going to do stuff that has that has something to do with uh, with the offshore wind industry and over here the same and, and just look at these things right this is again this is I don't know exactly what they're doing here, but you can see there's loads and loads and loads of these these wind turbine blades uh, lying over there. Maybe they're created in this factory, this facility over here. Uh, and, and there are loads and loads and loads of these uh, these large industri industrial places uh, where they create these these windmills essentially. Um, over here, this is, by the way, this is the place where uh, the Nord Stream 1 and 2 uh, landing places used to be. Or They are still there, but, you know, no, nothing is coming through the pipes. I actually saw this uh, facility with my own eyes. And what's interesting is that there is a nuclear power plant over here. And I don't believe that it ever produced electricity. Uh, so, so basically, it, it was finished right at the end, of, right when, you know, right when the, the Berlin Wall uh, fell. So, zooming into the ETS, this is going to put a strain on the steel industry. It's, it's, it's obvious they, they produce the most carbon dioxide emissions from all the industries. Then we have chemicals, you know, polymers, plastics, you name it. Then we get the automotive, which should have its own uh, point. I mean, the, the automotive is basically the culmination of steel, chemicals, metals, um, you know, polymers, all put together. So if you have high cost, high uh, carbon cost attached to all these, these different materials that you have to put into this car, then that is going to uh, make it harder to build cost competitive cars cement you know try to make cement without carbon emissions that's a really hard thing to do and paper and pulp again uh, and just go to japan if you want to see a lot of paper mills go to japan japan they have i mean they have paper mills i i, I, I was once making a map for japan and i found 20 paper mills without any, any any difficulty and china is even worse and they they still have coal plants powering their paper mills so the logic compounding issues just for a car for instance you know you need you need aluminium you need other metals you need glass polymers you need steel to get to get these materials you know these are not raw materials but to get these materials you need raw materials you need labor you need energy, you know, and, and, and the more expensive each component is, you know, you get you get the compounding issues in aluminium. If, if you get the same pressure, the same cost pressure uh, of raw materials, labor costs and energy in aluminium as you get in other metals, as you get in glass, as you get in polymers and as you get in steel, then all of these issues compound together. Uh, and they make sure that this Volkswagen Golf that is produced in Germany simply becomes much, much, much more expensive than this simple MG3 electric car that they're fabricating in China somewhere. The costs, the primary costs are lower. The secondary costs are lower, which makes the product cost less. It's that simple. It's that simple. So the critical failure of Germany... They closed 24 gigawatts of nuclear power since 2005. I made a I made a list. So over here you see a list of all these nuclear power plants that they closed. All of this, you know, taken together, 24 gigawatts. We can go back to the map again if you want to. Uh, right, and we go over here. Right, let's see. The tiny nuclear reactor over here, Mülheim Karlich. Some of these plants were closed earlier. They had more. They had even more uh, over here. I believe that this here is, let's see, what is it? Biblis? No. I don't know. Let's see. Let's zoom into another one. Because there's a, I've got all the nuclear power plants here. I didn't, I visited a lot of these. Here is Biblis. All right, Biblis. So over here, close this one. They're building a gas plant over here, which is a smart thing to do because what they're going to do is they, they're going to use reuse the infrastructure that is available to them. And they close 24 gigawatts of nuclear power plants. And that's an absolute shame. Um, I mean, the damage that they are doing with this 
is is just immense 24 gigawatts and one would say okay well just build 50 gigawatts of uh, wind and solar and then you're done that's not how it works because because wind and solar don't give you the power whenever you need it when you need it and, and that's what nuclear does so if you want to have industry and your industry says we need power all the time then you want nuclear power plants and if 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 a nuclear power plant goes out because of maintenance or whatever then you have multiple other nuclear power plants to take up the slack and then you know in, in in the case of german industry most of these industries actually have their own power plants as well so if you go to all the steel mills all the blast furnaces in germany they all have their own gas plants which is logical because they have syngas as a byproduct of making steel. But this means that they will burn every, you know, they, they will make sure that every carbon atom that doesn't get captured into the steel eventually ends up in the air somehow. So, so this, is, this is the major mistake, and, and, and it is their fault. It is the fault of Gerhard Schröder, it is the fault of Angela Merkel, who got freaked out by Fukushima, and it is the fault of our dear friend, Schultz, who basically he got he got a lot of messages. There were there were a lot of people telling him, "Listen, you don't have to kill these nuclear power plants." He still had six left, six six nuclear power plants to save, and he just he, he, Habeck said, "Listen, there's no way we can save them. It takes too long," and you know he, he just didn't want to do it. And and Schultz basically gave his colleague the go ahead because otherwise. The government would have fallen earlier. Personally, I would have much preferred the government having fallen earlier and us being able to save those six nuclear power plants than having it fall now because Volkswagen is, is teetering and because ThyssenKrupp is teetering. These are, these, are, these are fundamental things that we have to keep in mind really fundamental things that we need to keep in mind. So we're, we're talking about parties with big differences. So we have the SPD, the Social Democratic Party. Economics of the Social Democratic Party, you know, they focus on welfare spending, higher minimum wages and progressive taxation to reduce inequality. All very laudable goals, um, but we have to ask, have they gone too far? Are the wages in Germany too high? Or are the costs in Germany too high? Whichever way you go, I mean, it, 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 it always it, it, it always bites, you know, it, it, higher costs or higher wages. It, 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 it's potato, potato. So industrial, their industrial vision is they support the sustainable industry transformation. And for this, we're going back to the map in, 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 in a minute. And they push for more public investment in green technologies, right? I could make this blue as well, but there's more parties. And then energy, they promote the renewable energy expansion. They are cautious about fossil fuel phase out to protect jobs. And that's why they still have coal plants everywhere. The biggest coal plants, the lignite plants, they just keep running. And that's in part thanks to the SPD. They, they killed nuclear and they kept coal. It was a binary choice. It's that simple. And for nuclear, they're, they are advocating against nuclear energy, and they strongly support the phase-out and closure of the remaining plants. So the sustainable industry, what does that look like, right? So let's go to, let's go to the biggest industrial area in Germany. Over here, you can see all those yellow spots. And I'm sorry that they, 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 that they also use yellow road signs. So that makes it a little bit less, less clear. But here, this is this is, you know, big industry chemistry. Again, big industry chemistry over here. Uh, chemistry, still chemistry. Uh, this is steel. This here is cars. Big industry, but we, are, we we haven't reached the biggest yet. The big, biggest are here. So over here, steel, steel production, right? I mean, ThyssenKrupp, enormous, enormous com company. Again, steel over here, you know, steel. This over here, Siemens Mobility, they make trains. Um, if we go up again, more steel. And again, more steel over here, ArcelorMittal. And here's the giant 
I mean, this is incredible, isn't it? Thyssen Krupp. Now, some people wonder why is everything red and black and white in these plants, in these, these facilities. You need cokes, you know, coal, basically very pure coal, uh, in order to introduce the carbon that you need to reduce the iron oxide, because that's what the, what's over here, iron ore. And then you need the white stuff, the lime, in order to flux out all the, the crap that you don't need. And, and this is basically the industrial base of Germany. It's steel, it's car manufacturing, you know, it's aluminium over here, aluminium factory. I basically highlight all this stuff so, so that we can walk through, you know, what does it mean to have big industry in a country like Germany? Over here, all this is petrochemical as well, right? They make they make loads of products, loads of products. And right next to this, right next to this, this over here, what do we get? A huge, really big coal plant, right? Incredible, incredible. But just look at it. Again, chemistry, a large chemi chemi chemical plant. And, and, and it's all powered by these red, these red place markers. Those are all coal plants. And over here are the worst, right over here. This over here, you can see, this is where they are digging up the lignite. This is where they are burning the lignite. Um, so if you want to have big industry, and don't don't mistake me. I mean, this is the city Cologne over here, Cologne. This here, if you if you if you count all that stuff up over here, this is a car manufacturer. If you count all this stuff up and you would put it into the, you would you would overlay it. You know, the the, the same the, the the same size, and you would overlay it over over Cologne. It would reach outside the inner circle easily. Easily, it would reach outside inner circle. It would it would blot out the center of of Cologne. If you would if you would pick that up and drop it here, it would blot it out. So, if Schultz says I want to make all of this stuff uh, sustainable, this over here, you're in for it. That's a major major problem. So then we go to the greens. You know, again different policies they propose they proposes they propose the green economy making it even harder you know try to make this green over here jesus christ uh just look at sweden they're they're now working on on hydrogen steel which which may be a way out but they are still developing it you know and it's still not proven whether you can do hydrogen steel at cost parity with the chinese uh, they, they, they are heavily focused on sustainability, wealth taxes, and eco-friendly subsidies. Some of these subsidies were being axed by, you know, the finance minister, Lindler. Lindner. Then industrial, industrial policy, the advocate for strong environmental regulation. Whatever, you know, mainly has to do with, uh, with, uh, with exhaust gases and such. Industrial the advocate for strong environmental regulation incentivizes companies to adopt sustainable low emission practices. None of that is going on in Germany. All of them are still going on the same way that they did, and they simply cannot compete. They cannot compete. Energy, they want to build even more renewables, faster and more, no matter how much it costs. And they want to, they want, they say that they want the accelerated coal phase out. But if they really wanted that, they would have chosen to phase coal out first and then work on nuclear. They might have, they might have seen that it would be impossible to do. And nuclear, these people are firmly anti-nuclear. Now, then we have the Free Democratic Party, which is the odd duckling, uh, because they, they are quite different than the first two. They have an emphasis on low taxes. They really want, you know, free market capitalism as much as possible. Fiscal re responsibility. Having a government that doesn't, you know, doesn't overspend. Um, and support for entrepreneurs and business-friendly policies. So they are basically what in the Dutch uh, Dutch government, the VVD would be, for instance. They are in, in, in favor of innovation-led growth, deregulation, and a private sector-driven industrial advancement. So, I mean, they basically are, you know, oh, if you want to, we want to encourage you to do better, but there's no pressure. 
the Nanergy, they support a balanced energy mix, open to transitional fossil fuels, and favors technical solutions like carbon capture. Nuclear, more open to nuclear, viewing it as a transitional low-carbon option, but not actively promoting expansion. So what would a pro-nuclear Germany look like, right? We only have three parties in Germany that have, you know, a positive view about nuclear. We just spoke about them, the Free Democratic Party, open to nuclear as a low-carbon energy source. Interim, they really think that it needs to be an interim solution for energy security. Then we have the alternatives for Germany, which is a populist populist uh, party. They are strongly supportive of nuclear energy, and they oppose the phase-out and they are in favor of keeping react reactors open and even expanding capacity. Now, the trouble is, obviously, the reactors have not been saved. And then finally, you have the Christian, Christian Democratic Union and the Christian Social Union, or the CDU and the CSU. And they did a turnaround on nuclear. They basically became pro-nuclear very recently, and they... They were even calling for a moratorium on nu nuclear decommissioning. And I believe that they even want, they, they not just want to restart the nuclear power plants that might be saved, but they also are open to building new ones. So currently, what does the poll show us? So the CDU, the last party that we mentioned, 32.8%. Uh, the AFD, 17.2%. Together, that's 50%. So if, suppose, that in March the situation were as it were today, then they would get half of all the votes, and then the FDP would get roughly 4%. Um, so together they would, would be able to form a coalition, have roughly 54% of, of the mandate, which is not comfortable. You would, ideally, you would like to have, you know, closer to 60, because there's, there's always the risk that, that you know, that you may lose uh, what you've got because of dissenters or whatever. But in any case, for nuclear, if we consider nuclear, then this would look like a promising development. Now, finally, what I want to show you as well is that this, this here is by Radiant Ener Energy Group. The restart of Germany's reactors, can it be done? And they basically say, yes, it can be done. Now, the question is how much, uh, how much decommissioning has taken place? Uh, but they basically say Ezer 2, Brockdorf, Gronde, Krimmel, Neko Westheim 2, and Emsland, they can definitely be restarted. And then Gundramingen and uh, Gundramingen B and C not. Those are boiling water reactors. All of the rest are pressurized water reactors. Now, this is also interesting over here because they they they, they even looked at, you know, what, what does the region say? You have Bavaria, uh, they are pro-nuclear, then you have Schleswig-Holstein, they are against nuclear you know most of these regions are against nuclear whether that is still the case uh, remains to be seen and then over here you see the owners of these nuclear power plants you can see rwe and enbw those are not uh, favorable to nuclear but eon and Vattenfall are favorable so they have an ease of restart uh, basically a, a, a circle a, a circle diagram where you can see where they think that it that it should be doable to restart these things, and top of mind are Ezer two, Brockdorf and Kronde uh, and Krummel. Those should be easiest to restart out of all the nuclear power plants that were uh, shut down in the last six seven years. So this is an interesting interesting website. I really recommend that you that you that you seek this this document out radiantenergygroup.com i will make sure that a link in the description is below and with that you have made it to the end of this video please if you learned anything make sure that you are subscribed and that you like the video if you want to let us know what you think about this subject please do so in the comments below and in order to make sure that i can feed my family i have a little patreon account and if you would be so kind to become a member there i would be very grateful now thank you all for watching and may the strong force be with you bye bye